if you've been keeping up with this little mini series, first of all, big ups, thank you. You're still here. Respect for sticking with me. You'll know that in the last two episodes, we looked at issue one and issue two of what is possibly my favourite comic book of all time. Back in 1995, when the Texas Chainsaw Massacre went down on Friday the 13th and two horror legends clashed buttered heads, met and chilled for the first time. That's right, we had some blood spilling and we had a lot of unexpected horror mass slasher character chilling. But don't be surprised if you... I've got a feeling that all that is about to change in the final finale issue. So let's get into it. Without further ado, let's get straight into issue three, the final issue of Jason vs. Leatherface. So just a quick recap. We saw Jason get removed from Crystal Lake, at which point he ended up making his way to Texas, getting tied up with the infamous Sawyer family from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And at first, Jason and Leatherface clashed, but in an unexpected twist, they actually all ended up becoming friends. And after staying the night, Jason then spent the next day with the Sawyer family, getting involved in all their day-to-day -day activities. The last comic ended with Jason stopping Hitchhiker from bullying Leatherface and to avoid further confrontation, he retreated to the attic where he discovered an old Sawyer family photo and found out a little bit more about their family's history. So that brings us to this point, issue three. And this cover again is fucking bonkers. Like the other two covers, it's painted by the legendary Simon Bisley, and this time it looks like Jason is exploding out of the underworld, surrounded by skewered dead bodies that almost look like some sort of sacrificial ritual placed there to summon a demon. There's bones and skulls flying through the air, Jason is wrapped up in chains like fucking spawn, and his blade looks like the most brutal chunk of steel ever. His guts are hanging out of his stomach, this shit looks like an Iron Maiden album cover. It's the only one of the covers not to feature Leatherface, but again, like all the others, it's completely fucking random, nothing to do with the story inside, yet somehow just works incredibly well, and reminds us just how fucking epic this comic and this character is. So here we have it, the face-off, and this one doesn't start with a narration like the other two comics do, this one's straight into it. We also see an image of the photograph, the family portrait that we saw in the last comic, but it's interesting to note that they've drawn it again. They didn't just reprint the picture that they'd already drawn. I don't know why, because it's not even a fact of laziness, it's the fact that you want it to look exactly the same, and this is a completely different drawing. It's the same pose and everything like that, but it's been completely redrawn. I'm not sure why they could have got away with using the one from the other comic, but moving on. So we see Jason do something again that we've never seen him do ever. Be sort of like a gentle giant. He picks up Grandpa and helps him into the lift so that they can send him downstairs. Again, this is the first time we've ever seen Jason help anyone ever. Cook says, Leatherface, heads up, I'm sending Grandpa down. As they make their way downstairs, Cook tells Jason that they're having Kuta pie tonight. Now this could mean one of two things. Kuta is the name of a small turtle that lives in America. It could also mean the name of a female vagina. So with these guys, you never really fucking know what you're getting. It's probably the fucking latter. So even though Cook came to apologise on behalf of Ichaika, Ichaika's still steaming, he's still acting a cunt, but then again, when is he not acting a cunt? But he puts it on Leatherface and accuses him of reading one of his comics. Now, to be fair, it is an issue one of the Invincible Iron Man, which is worth like a shit ton of money. So I can understand why he's pissed off that Leatherface has been touching it. Either way, he uses this as an excuse to start another fight with him. Why did I tell you about reading my funny book, huh? Huh? You stupid or something, boy? There's only one way you're ever going to learn to stay away from what's mine. And that's if I make sure you don't forget your lessons. Hitchhiker pulls out his signature knife and starts swinging at Leatherface, cutting his arm. He tells Leatherface that when he's finished with him, he's going to need a whole leather bodysuit to go with his mask. Again, Jason, who we know now doesn't like to see Leatherface being bullied, grabs Hitchhiker by the back of the neck and lifts him off the ground. Crash! Jason throws Hitchhiker across the room again. This time, though, Hitchhiker's had enough. Rather than resorting to self-harm, he jumps in the air and attacks Jason. It's funny because Cook's like, Hitch, not at the dinner table! And I know I keep mentioning it, but I just think it's funny that this family's whole life revolves around eating. It's like a sacred tradition to them. Fuck! Hitchhiker shanks his fucking pocket knife into Jason's chest. How do you like that, hockey head? But Jason just looks at him completely unfazed, looks at the pocket knife, pulls it out and throws it on the ground. So now Hitchhiker's fucking shitting himself. So as he's running away, Cook tells Leatherface to go and get his chainsaw. Cook runs in the kitchen and grabs the meat cleaver. Jason's smashing up the living room. It's all kicking off. 
Hitchhikers ducking and dodging and bobbing and weaving. Jason swings his machete and misses and whoosh, accidentally takes the head off Aunt Amelia. So now Cook's pissed off. He steps up with the meat cleaver. Funk! Takes a swing, slams it into the centre of Jason's back. Jason reaches round, pulls the meat cleaver out and chunk, throws it into the fucking wall. Jason's now chasing him down the hallway. Cook's like, you would have to start something. Obviously this whole fucking thing has happened because Hitchhiker instigated all of it, the fucking idiot. Jason continues his pursuit. They run behind a door, slam it, hoping the big metal door's gonna hold Jason back and BOOM! He just fucking punches straight through it like a fucking boss man. So Jason steps into the kitchen. He's now got both Cook and Hitchhiker cornered. They're both trying to talk to him and reason with him. But look at Jason's face. At this point, there's no talking to Jason. But all of a sudden, we hear that familiar sound. Vroom, vroom, vroom. And standing in the frame of the shattered metal security door is Leatherface with his chainsaw raised high above his head. The artist does a really good job in this comic of one minute drawing Leatherface really dumb and sympathetic looking and then the next minute looking really fucking sinister. And right now, he looks ready for war. He looks fully ready to defend the family honour. Get him, Leatherface! Get that son, bitch! Hitchhiker's there, egging Leatherface on. Vroom, vroom, vroom. It's almost like Jason doesn't even want to fight him, though. And as they look at each other, Jason's got his machete down. He doesn't raise it to Leatherface. They've kind of got this bond now, and he doesn't want to fight him. But as Jason's got his guard down, vroom! Leatherface takes a swing at his stomach and takes a huge fucking chunk out of him. Jason just stands there, observing what's just happened. And the narration lets us know what's going on inside his head. For the first time in his existence, Jason has gone against his nature. Instead of destroying, he chose to defend another. And this is how he is repaid. Jason thought he had finally found someone who understood what it was like to be different, to be apart from the others, someone like him. But as he might be, Leatherface had one thing in common with all the others. He was alive and living. New love, even if it was the love of a stunted, twisted family. And all that loves must die. And as a reader, we really have to sympathise with Jason at this point because this is the only time that he's ever given anybody an inch and look what's happened to him. This is also the first time ever that Jason's had anything that resembles a friend that wasn't his mom, Someone who gets him, someone who wears a mask and kills people. This is the only time Jason's ever not raised his machete back when someone's tried to attack him and look what fucking happened. The dude ripped a chainsaw through his chest. So right now, in this moment, it's back on. Jason's back to old Jason. No fucks given. And it's this point when we're treated to everything that we've been wanting from this comic. The full splash page of Jason and Leatherface locked in fucking combat. Bram, 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 chainsaw revving. Whoosh, Jason smashing his machete into Leatherface's arm. Bram, Leatherface swings his chainsaw. Jason dodges, Whoosh, ching, counters it with the machete blade. I love these power lines, it proper shows the impact. I love power lines in comics. Brum! Leatherface swings the chainsaw round again, but he gets it stuck inside one of the hanging corpse's bodies. Seizing the opportunity, whoosh -ching! Jason comes round with the machete and whacks it into Leatherface's wrist. He lets go of the chainsaw, the chainsaw now stuck ticking in the middle of a corpse. Jason fucking stares at him like, I've got you now, cunt. Thunk! Out of nowhere, Hitchhiker jumps in the air and smashes Jason in the top of the head with a hammer. As he drops his machete, his body collapses to the floor and we see all his brains spill out the top of his head. You reckon he's dead? He's got brains leaking out of his ears. How the hell could someone be alive after something like that? No harm in making sure. He wasn't easy to kill, that for damn sure. So while Jason lays on their kitchen floor, they all decide what they're going to do with him. Naturally, Hitchhiker says let's just eat him. But Cook, having a bit more of a heart, says, No, that just don't seem right. Jason was a good old boy. Maybe he didn't have no more sense than to get himself wrapped up in family matters he didn't have no business in. But he was more than just meat. It wouldn't be proper to dress him out and cook him like the rest. Sads, something tells me he's tougher than a cheap steak. Cook decides that Jason deserves a proper Sawyer family burial. He mentions a dude called Cousin Emery that Hitchhiker must have killed with a 2x4 over a game of checkers and he wants to give Jason the same send-off that they gave that guy. So while Cook goes off to make preparations and find something to weigh Jason's body down, Hitchhiker decides that he wants to see what's underneath Jason's mask. And we get this really cool POV kind of shot where we, the audience, are inside Jason's mask peering out through the eye holes. 
But just as he's about to lift it off his face, Leatherface steps in and tells him no. Hitchhiker jumps up like, you telling me no, boy? And Leatherface looks at him with a fucking evil look in his eye like, I'm telling you, no. This is also another really deep moment because it's the first time in the whole comic that we see Leatherface actually stand up to Hitchhiker and it's to defend the honour of his friend. Leatherface is in a really fucked up dilemma here because he didn't want to attack Jason. Jason was his fucking boy. He was probably the only person he's ever met again that he could relate to. And even though when he had to draw a line in the sand and he had to take a side and defend his family against Jason, he still has respect for him and he still understands that no, that's important, you do not take his fucking mask off. Hitchhiker finally yields and agrees with him. He tells Leatherface that he understands what he's saying, a man has got a right to his privacy and it also looks like the mask has fused to his fucking face anyway. We cut to later that evening and the Sawyer family have got Jason in the back of a truck, drove him out to some kind of lake and are going to dump his body in the water. Hitchhiker makes a comment about how he still thinks it's a waste of good meat and that they could always make jerky out of him. To which Cook replies, No one's asking you, Hitch. I just couldn't bring myself to serve poor Jason here up in a stew. That's your problem, Hitch. You never think about other folks' failings. The same can't be said about Leatherface though, who genuinely looks sad to be saying goodbye to his friend as he puts Jason's machete back into his lifeless hand. They tie a breeze block around Jason's ankles and prepare to throw him into the water. Cook asks if anybody has any last words and Hitchhiker says yeah, rotting hell dickweed and kicks Jason into the water. Cook tells Hitchhiker that he is so uncouth and Leatherface throws a rose into the lake in memory of his friend. As Jason's body sinks to the bottom of the lake, we see Cousin Emery that was mentioned earlier. And as we get to the end pages, we get the final bit of narration that concludes the story. Water. It always begins with water, and it always ends with water. In a way, Jason finds the predictability of his situation comforting. It reminds him of the fairy tales his mother used to read him. They always began the same, always ended the same, just like his life. He has spent the vast majority of the last 20 years seeing the world through a scrim of murky water. The sight of the moon warped by the ever-shifting skin of the pond reminds Jason of home. He has been away from Crystal Lake far too long. This strange alien place has been filling his head with equally alien thoughts and feelings, things such as compassion, friendship. These things are unnatural. Jason could return to the cannibal's house and kill them all, one by one, without any trouble. Then again, he could have slaughtered them at any given time, but he didn't. Jason begins to wonder why, but loses interest halfway through the thought. He has had enough of strange people and different places. It's time to go home. And he has a long, long way to go before he gets there. So this is when we see that they didn't kill Jason. They didn't come close. They just knocked him out for a bit. He cuts himself free from the ropes and rises to the top of the lake like he always does. So rather than go back to the Sawyer house and take revenge and kill everyone, Jason decides he's going to walk back to Crystal Lake, and it is a fucking long way. To walk from Texas to New Jersey doesn't even bear thinking about how long that would take, but somehow Jason pulls it off, and in this final panel of the comic, we see him walking past a Crystal Lake sign to show that he made his way home. So that's it, the story of Jason vs Leatherface, what a fucking awesome little three part crossover it is, so many clever little moments from how they get Jason to Texas to how he tells the Sawyers his name, the differences in how they kill their victims and the emotional heart and soul that they give both of the characters. I feel like if this story was canon and if this was all legit we would have gotten to know these guys better in these three comics than any of the movies that feature them in. What I also think is really interesting in this story is that we get to see Jason and Leatherface both as like these misguided dogs with bad owners or upbringings. I feel like if it was just these two in this comic, they would have met up and lived together as friends pretty peacefully. But it's all the interaction from the humans around them that kind of forced them to go to war with each other, as the only time that they fight is when they're baited into it. And even up to the very end, Jason and Leatherface both have this mad respect and understanding for each other. Whether he was more of a Jason or a Leatherface fan going into this, I'd like to think that this comic did service to both franchises, because what could have been a very simple straightforward storyline of these two dudes just fighting each other with a bunch of teenagers stuck in the middle and a plotline that we didn't care about, we was instead given a really cool and unique story that honours both franchises and gives us a crossover like no other, and one that I think thrives even more with it being told in the form of a comic book. 
I really hope that you enjoyed this little mini series. I would definitely like to do more with this format and with this comic being pretty hard to find or expensive, I hope that you think I did it some kind of justice. If you enjoyed today's video, please don't forget to give it a like and if you're not already subscribed to the channel, I'd also like to hear what was your favourite part of this comic. So, in the comments below, let me know. Also, let me know if there's any other comic book crossovers that you think I should be covering and let me know what's your favourite comic. Let's chop it up in the comments below and get some comic book conversation popping. You can also get at me on Instagram at Theo underscore Kane underscore Slimehouse. I try and post lots of exclusive content on there every single day. And if you want to be a slime renegade and help make Slimehouse bigger and better than ever, for just $1 a month, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash Slimehouse TV and become a slime renegade. Also, we've got lots of cool exclusive t-shirts coming out every single month for the rest of the year. So head over to slimehousestore.com and see which ones pop in this month. They're always exclusive. They run for one month, pre-order only, then it ends. You'll never get that t-shirt again. So head over to slimehousestore.com and see if there's anything you fancy. With all that being said, I'm going to catch you in the next video. My name's Theo Kane. Pow! <laughs>